I don't know about you, but I'm a, a DIY kind of guy. I like to watch this old house and uh, home improvement things. And um, my, my wife likes that I do that. Every time I do one of those things, she'll say, you know, you just saved us $300 or you just saved us $1,000. And I guess that's good. I, I like doing it. I guess I got it from my dad because I don't like to have to wait on plumbers or electricians or carpenters or uh, appliance repair people uh, in order to, to, to fix a problem that's a lot of times very simple to fix. And you know, if you do that stuff long enough after a while, you learn some secrets for being able to do it. Um, I guess if you do anything for long enough, you learn some secrets, right? And I'll give you an example of that. Um, I used to hate to hang drywall. It wasn't actually hanging the drywall that I didn't like, but what I didn't like is that, you know, um, anytime you're hanging drywall, there's gonna be roughed in electrical boxes, either outlet boxes or switch boxes. And I would measure so carefully, measure really carefully to an eighth of an inch for those boxes. And I would draw them out and I would cut them so carefully. And whenever you put the drywall off, it was always cattywampus off. It didn't matter how carefully you measured. And then you'd have to cut out for the thing, and then there'd be a big hole that you'd have to smear in with joint compound or get some like enormous switch plate or outlet plate in order to hide the big hole that you put there. One day I went over to a friend's house who was finishing his basement. And, uh, and, and, and all of a sudden I was, you know, looking gaga at his wall and I said, how did you get your holes cut so perfectly around your electrical boxes? Like, how do you measure for that? And he said, oh, you don't measure for it. I said, you don't measure for it. I said, how did you do it? He said, well, I'll show you. And so he said, here, because he was still working on it, he said, uh, you know, take this piece of drywall and hold it up where it goes. And, uh, and, I, and I did that. And, uh, and, and then he had a kind of rough idea of where those boxes were. He took a scrap piece of wood and a hammer, turned to the side, and he laid it over the box, and he went, bam, a kind of a sharp rap, not really hard, but a kind of a sharp rap. And when he took it down, there was an indentation of the box around where he had whacked it. And then he just cut out around that, and it went right up into place. And, um, you know, if you keep at something long enough, you'll learn the secrets of it. You know, Paul had written to the church at Philippi. He said this, he said, in any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And Paul had learned a secret. He learned the secret of being content in difficult circumstances. When he wrote this, he was in prison. He learned the secret of being content. And, and he learned the secret of those things when he was in circumstances that were unpleasant and that he couldn't do anything about. And, and I've you know, read that many times throughout my Christian life, I read that, and I was always very annoyed with Paul for writing that. And, I, and I'll tell you why I was annoyed with that. If, if I had said to my friend, um, hey, how did you get those boxes, cut the holes cut for those boxes so perfectly, and he said, oh, I know a secret, and then he went on to something else that wouldn't be very helpful. So Paul says, yeah, I've learned the secret of uh, being filled and uh, having nothing. And I, and I would always say, uh, so Paul, you want to let us in on what the secret is? And then one day when I was reading in Romans chapter 8, I realized that he had. Let me read to you today from Romans chapter 8, verses 28 to 39. We know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called 
And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is it that condemns? Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Father, the Apostle Paul had learned the secret. And uh, Lord, in, in your good care for us, through your word, you've revealed to us that secret. By your spirit, I pray, help us to apply it today. Through Christ our Lord. When you face circumstances or a situation that's, that's difficult, um, that is persistent, it won't go away, and you're powerless to do anything about it, you need to change two to four. That's Paul's secret. Change two to four. Now before I talk about what Paul means, let me tell you what Paul's not saying in this passage. Though sometimes some well-meaning Christians, well-meaning but mistaken, will say this is what the Bible teaches, what Paul's saying. Paul is not talking about when you face difficulty. He's not talking uh, merely about the positive or talking about the, uh, the attitude of having merely a positive attitude the kind of the power of positive thinking, as some people have called it. Now look, I don't deny that positive thinking is better than negative thinking. I've never met anybody who said, yep, I was in a really big jam, but I got myself out of it by negative thinking, right? I've never met anybody who's done that. So I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not denigrating thinking positively. And often in life, um, when you're facing a situation, a better attitude about it will help a lot. But mere positive thinking in every situation can be a way of deceiving ourselves. Um, it can be a way of minimizing evil. Either surd evil, you know what surd evil is? S-U-R-D, it means evil that just kind of uh, comes upon us. So you think of people who lose their home because of a forest fire or a flood or an earthquake or a landslide or something like that. That would be an example of surd evil that comes upon us and there's, and there's real deprivation there. Or moral evil, when there's a moral agent who with malice or negligence or something brings harm to us. And, and mere positive thinking can be a way of minimizing evil. You know, in uh, Jeremiah chapter 29, the, the whole uh, uh, account of Jeremiah is basically God talking to Jeremiah and telling him that the people are going to go into captivity, that, that, they've, that they've reached the limit of God's patience with them. 
that they're going to go into captivity in Babylon and that captivity is going to be for 70 years. Well, Jeremiah was the prophet through whom God was speaking, but Israel had other prophets, other preachers, and these prophets were giving a different message. Their message was, hey, don't worry about it. It's really not going to be that long. When, when, when you get there, you know what? We can even give you a biblical text for it. When you get there, like Moses did in Egypt, keep the sandals on your feet, keep your loins girded, be ready to leave because you're not going to be staying here very long. And this is what God said through Jeremiah. He said, do not let your prophets deceive you and do not listen to them. For it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them. And, and what they were doing was essentially saying, hey, you just need to think positively about this situation. If you think positively about it, it, it it'll pass quickly. It's going to be a, a, a blip on the radar screen. If you just believe things will be better, they will be better. And it was a way of minimizing the, the suffering, the real suffering that they were going to have in Babylon, uh, of which God said through Jeremiah, settle down there and get used to it. Because some of you are actually going to die in that situation. You won't be coming back. You know, Paul here in the book of Romans he mentions things like tribulation, hardship, persecution, famine, destitution, that's what he means by nakedness, danger, and violent death, that's what he means by sword. Uh, only a fool could look at words like that and say, but look on the bright side, right? And Paul did not say to the Philippians, hey, you know, I've, I've learned that, that suffering deprivation and want, that being in this prison, I've learned that it's not really so bad. There's perks to this here. I just need to think positively. He didn't say that. So Paul is here not extolling uh, some kind of power, merely of thinking positively about things. Let me tell you what else Paul is not saying, though sometimes some well-meaning but mistaken Christians uh, will tell you this. Paul's not saying, find joy in the Lord and forget your circumstances. Forget your situation. It doesn't mean anything. You, you know, by that logic, I want you to think about that logic. If you were to carry it to its nth degree, you could say to somebody, why, even if you wind up, if you end up in hell, just find inner joy. It's well-meaning, but it's not really biblical. You know, we read today uh, Psalm 126 as our responsive reading. And this is a psalm that has to do with Israel coming back from the captivity in Babylon. It's celebrating the release of their captivity in Babylon. And we're told that God brought the captives back to Zion. And in verse 2, it says, Then it was said among the nations, The Lord has done great things for them. And what they're saying is that as they're delivered, people can look at it and say, God's blessed them, good things have happened to them. You know, salvation has no ultimate meaning if it does not mean salvation from the situations that cause our suffering. And believing that, that joy is some simply, simply some um, internal, esoteric, spiritual state and that, and that your suffering is just to be ignored or downplayed or denied because somehow it's not really real or it doesn't matter, bears more resemblance to Stoicism or to Gnosticism than it does to Christianity. When you face difficult, discouraging, persistent situations that you can't do anything to change, you're powerless to change, what do you do? Well, Paul had learned the secret. And the secret wasn't 
the power merely of positive thinking. The secret was not to find inner joy and just deny or ignore the situation that you suffer. The secret was to change two into four. Now, to explain what I mean, I want you to consider first what we're told in James verse 1 and chapter 20. You know, sometimes I'll hear people say that, uh, that James and Paul are at odds. I guess they're talking about what they say about justification because they talk about justification in different senses. But actually, as I read James and I read Paul, I, I see people walking arm in arm in what they have to say particularly about this. And so James 1.20 says this, the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Let me say that again. The anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Let me ask you a question. You think about it. When do you tend to get angry? You tend to get angry, don't you? when things don't go your way and you can't fix it. You can't fix it. And it may be that you do that for selfish reasons. It may be that you do it for noble reasons. I, I just want the best for others or my, or my children or my grandchildren. And there's a situation here that's, that, that's threatening their well-being or their safety. I can't fix it. And so you get angry. And you hope, I don't know what, that your anger gets the attention of the universe and things will change. Or, or at least you might have the satisfaction of venting your spleen, being able to stamp your foot, at least show that you're angry at it. When that anger turns toward God, it, it, as it does in the recesses of our hearts, we don't even formulate the words. But they're there. And the words go like this. Why are you doing this to me? Why are you doing this to me? Paul had learned a secret. It was a secret that James knew, too. Let me read to you from chapter uh, 1, in verses 2 through 8 of what James says. Consider it all joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. And perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man, unstable in all he does. James says, consider it all joy when you face trials. He's not saying consider the trials themselves joy. But he's saying, he's saying consider it all joy when you face those trials. Why? He says, because those trials produce in you perseverance. And that perseverance finishes its work so that you may be, the word here is really perfect, complete. See, do you understand that God has a goal for you in Christ? It's that you will be perfect and complete to look exactly like him. And James says that's the, that's the purpose, the reason why God brings trial into your life. And he says this, he says, now if any of you lacks wisdom, not wisdom in general, wisdom about this, wisdom and understanding, that God is bringing these things into your life for a purpose, he says, let him ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and that wisdom will be given to him. But when he asks, 
He must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed about. This one should not think that he'll receive anything from the Lord, for he's double-minded, unstable in all his ways. See, that's the, the secret that Paul had learned. He found the same thing. You know what the secret is? The secret is to turn to, is to change to into four. In other words, the question is not, why are you doing this to me? Things that you suffer are real things. But what we're told here in the book of Romans is that they're not forever. Paul says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worthy comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. See, those sufferings have a purpose. He goes on to say that the creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subject to futility, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. God has a purpose in what he brings. Paul understood that he needed to turn two into four. And so listen to what we, uh, what we read in Romans 8, 28 and 29. And we know that in all things, God works for the good. For those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, listen to this, this is the purpose for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. That's the purpose. And then in verse 31 and following, he says, what shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give to us all things? See, the secret is in learning to ask in the deepest recesses of our heart, not why is this happening to me, but why is this happening for me? The secret is in changing two into four. Because if you love the Lord, Paul tells us, then all things work together for good, for your good. Now, you know, you have to understand that I think a lot of people read that and they say, well, certainly I understand that all good things work together for my good. No, look at the context in which Paul's speaking. He talks about famine. He talks about nakedness. He talks about peril. He talks about sword. And it's when he's talking about those things that he says, we know that in all things, God works together for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purposes. You know, I, I, I love the answer. I'm just going to quote part of it. The, the answer to the first question of the Heidelberg Catechism, what is your only comfort in life and death? And part of the answer to that is this. He preserves me in such a way that without the will of my heavenly Father, not a hair can fall from my head. Indeed, all things must work together for my salvation. Right? And I love that catechism because it's not mere information. It's a conviction. It's a conviction that's based upon the scriptures. He preserves me in such a way that apart from the will of my heavenly father, not a hair can fall from my head. Are you aware of how many hairs fall from your head in a given day? Because I'll tell you that God is. God knows how many hairs fall from your head. That's how intimately familiar he is and concerned with your life. 
And it's on the basis of that that the divines who wrote that catechism says, because of that, indeed, all things have to work together for my salvation, have to work together for my perfection. If you love the Lord, and if you're called according to God's purpose. And Paul doesn't leave us in the dark as to what that purpose is. It's to look exactly like Christ. It's to reach the fullness of what you were created to be. And if you are called according to God's purpose, then he will not allow anything into your life that won't achieve that goal. But he will also bring into your life everything that is necessary to achieve it. Even things that you wish he didn't and that I wish he didn't. Because Paul understood that, he could face poverty, he could face persecution, he could face famine, he could face death, and he could say, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors to him of loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, that's something bad, or life, that's good, neither angels, they're good, nor demons, they're bad, neither the present, whatever your circumstance or situation is, or the future, which is unknown, not any powers, that word uh, encompasses all the powers that Paul faced, the town councils, the Jewish councils, the Roman government, neither height nor depth, and here I think is the key, nor anything else in all of creation. This is all encompassed in God's creation. Will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know, reflecting on these words, Augustus, top lady, wrote the words to the hymn. It's, it's almost really a, a paraphrase of these words, but poetically said. Things future, nor things that are now, nor all things below or above, can make God his purpose forego, or sever my soul from his love. You may really dislike some of the things that God brings into your life. I do. Evil is really evil. There's not a thing in the scripture which sugarcoats it or justifies it. But there's also the promise that if you belong to Christ, and that is an all-important if, because the promise is not for everyone, not this promise. That if you belong to Christ, if you love the Lord, then nothing comes into your life but that God has determined to bring about his purpose of killing off your sin and your self-sufficiency and conforming you to the precise image of of his son. You may think you know better. And I may think I know better. But God is wiser than you. And the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. I want you to notice one last thing here. It's not merely that God in his unfathomable, good and loving wisdom determined what you must suffer in order to perfect you, but he determined what his son must suffer 
what his son must suffer in order to perfect you. And so he says, what shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how will he not, along with him, freely give to us all things? So you want to know the secret of steadfastness and contentment and confidence and joy in the face of want, in the face of persecution, in the face of sickness, in the face of injustice, in the face of suffering, even in the face of death. Look at the situation which you face which is persistent and you're powerless to change and learn to ask not why is this happening to me but ask why is this happening for me that's the secret to change two into four you pray with me Our Father Jesus is the author and perfecter of our faith. And Lord, help us to remember that when we are led through difficulty, we're being led through difficulty. That Jesus has gone first. That he, for us and for our salvation, came down and he faced suffering. He faced injustice. He faced cruelty. He faced uh, evil, the third evil of hunger and, and the moral evil of hatred when he had done no wrong. And Father, help us, we pray, to consider it all joy when we face various trials, to put away our anger, that anger that arises because we see a situation, it persists, we feel threatened by it, we can't change it. And so in our heart of hearts, we tend to ask, why are you doing this to me? But give us wisdom. Help us to see your great purpose. And give to us the grace to be able to change two into four. And Father, we'll delight to see how you work in us to bring us to maturity through that. Through Christ our Lord. Amen.